I, I had the honor this morning of introducing an old friend, a uh, young man by the name of Jerome Adams. Dr. Adams is a board certified anesthesiologist and served as the Indiana State Health Commissioner from 2014 to 2017. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and physiology, I'm sorry, in psychology, uh, from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I like that because my daughter went to UMBC as well. Uh, a master of public health degree from the University of California at Berkeley, and is MD at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Um, I met uh, Dr. Adams when both he and I served on the advisory committee for the Fairbanks School of Public Health there in Indiana. Now, Dr. Um, Adams, um, when he first became the health commissioner, he was really new um, to this, but he got to work very quickly. He had to roll up his sleeves because some of you may know that he had to deal with one of the worst HIV outbreaks uh, in the country, in middle America, um, in a population that people didn't think would be getting HIV, um, and it was um, also um, involved with the use of opioids and other drugs. So it was a very, very complicated outbreak. Um, but he worked in a, a really profound manner, um, working with the, um, his, um, his then governor, um, Governor Pence, um, with the CDC, with the local health department and others, um, to get their hands around the epidemic. And so, um, Dr. Adams, I just want to publicly thank you for the work you did on that, because that was really great work. Um, his motto as Surgeon General is better health through better partnerships. So I cannot think of anyone um, who really has um, a better place to bring our theme for our Public Health Week and his motto together um, as, a, as a single thought. So, ladies and gentlemen, the 20th Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Jerome Adams. Thank you, sir. I knew you were going to do that, Georges. Tried to set me up. Well, good afternoon, everyone. You all can do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. It is fabulous to be here today. Uh, I really am excited for Public Health Week. I was thinking about what I was going to say to you all weekend long, uh, and hopefully I don't disappoint. We're going to do some questions and answers at the end, so make sure you all think of some good hard ones. And because everyone expects this of me, we're going to do some selfies, but we're going to do them up front instead of at the end because you, after the Q&As, I don't know if you all are going to like me much anymore. <laughs> but we're going to make sure we get... Everyone in there, ready? Say Public Health Week. One, two, three. Public Health Week. All right, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. I, I want to thank, thank uh, Dr. Telfair for having me here and Dr. Benjamin. It's just been great to, to meet with folks who, who think like I think. Uh, we talked a lot about the sensible middle, and that's what I'm going to touch on a little bit during my talk, and I want to thank the panel. I don't know why they put you all up here before I, I came up, but thank you for, for being here. I had great conversations with, with most of you all, and I really hope to tee up a great panel discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I know, I know you all are going to learn a lot from these individuals because they represent very different points of view, all looking towards the same goal. I was so glad to hear the theme for this year's National Public Health Week is changing our future together. Strengthening relationships within communities is key to improving health, and I commend you all for embracing the idea of better partnerships. As your Surgeon General, I want each and every one of you to know. I want you to know that I believe with every fiber of my being that every American deserves to live a long and healthy life. Unfortunately, we're falling short of that goal. As many of you know, you're public health experts yourselves. Life expectancy in the United States has declined for the second year in a row. Elise and I were talking about kids earlier. She is the mom of two five-and-a-half-year-old twins. Can you all believe that? And she's got one more at home. I'm the parent of a 13, a 12, and an 8-year-old who I just left over at the White House for the Easter egg roll. So I hope they aren't causing any incidents over there at the moment. But you know what? 
Unfortunately, both Elise and I, and several of you all in this room, are part of the first generation of parents in the last half a century who, as of right now, can't tell their children they're going to outlive us. Think about that. A half a century, and every generation has been able to look their kids in the eye and say, you're going to live longer than me. Right now, we can't say that. We can't say that. As your Surgeon General, I'm determined not to accept that fate for my children, for Elise's children, or for any of our children. My vision is for a healthier and a more equitable America, but it can only be achieved if we reframe the way we think about and we talk about health in this country. By now, most of you in the room are familiar with the varying degrees, the HIV outbreak in Scott County that Dr. Benjamin spoke of, so I'm not going to belabor it. A town of 4,000 people never had more than three HIV cases in a single year, now over 230 cases of HIV, all related to injection drug use. The experiences I had and the lessons I learned during that HIV outbreak are exactly why I treasure the opportunity that has been given to me to be the Surgeon General of the United States. I'm often invited to speak at large conferences in rooms similar to, bigger than the one that I'm in today. But I feel I truly have the biggest impact when I can help facilitate local discussions. Just as they say all politics is local, all health is local. And I personally feel we can only meaningfully and sustainably change health when local partners come together and create local solutions. Some of you all may not like to hear me say this, but you know, the folks in DC aren't gonna ride in on a white horse and save the day. There's a lot we can do from here in DC. There's a lot the federal government can do and should do and must do, but we're only going to create that change, that meaningful, that sustainable change on a local level. I want to share with you all a little bit of a personal story about me that you may not have heard. One of the challenging things when you're going out and giving multiple talks is that sometimes people hear you a couple of times and they get tired of the same old story. So we thought of a different one to share with you this weekend, but I think it really drives home the point of partnerships and public health week. I'm a physician, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned, and I'm very proud of that. When most Americans think about health, they think about me in a white coat. They think about prescription medications. They think about vital signs. But we in the public health community know that the reality is health is so much more than health care. Health care is critical, but health is so much more than health care. Some of you may have heard me tell the story about my childhood as a chronic asthmatic, which led to frequent hospitalizations as a child. The interactions I had with the health care sector piqued my interest in medicine and influenced my decisions to become a physician. Yet my experiences in the hospital are not what I consider my first exposure to public health. I didn't grow up in a wealthy family by any means. Had two school teachers for parents, very proud of them. We had four kids that ballooned up at different times in varying amounts, as I'll go into in a little bit. And I honestly did not realize how poor we were back then, but we, we weren't well to do, let me put it that way. But I was blessed to have loving and supportive parents who cared for me throughout my childhood, just a little over an hour away from here in rural Maryland. My parents raised me to work hard, to be humble, and also to care for those around me. That last lesson is one that particularly stuck with me, perhaps a little bit too much to my parents' liking, and I'll share that with you now. Whenever I noticed a classmate that was getting picked on, or a friend, or a teammate who didn't have a parent to spend time with, or a meal to go home to, I'd invite them to come to my house. Sometimes they'd stay for a meal, sometimes they'd stay the night, sometimes they'd stay the whole weekend. Now, on more than one occasion, they stayed several weeks, and sometimes for the whole summer. I often saw that those friends, they weren't the fully happy, energetic, and vibrant people that they could be. And I saw how they would light up after a good meal, after time spent with my family, after time with a loving and laughing place, a safe place to stay. My parents would all often joke, and shouldn't say this, but they'd say 
Jerome's out there always collecting strays and bringing them home. And my family went as far as to welcome my friend and now my brother, Damien, who's been in and out of the foster care system his entire life. And we brought him into our home and adopted him in a much more formal manner. I didn't realize it at the time, but this experience as a youth, trying to create an environment where others could thrive, was really my first foray into public health. No, I wasn't involved in making drinking water safer or in prom promoting a vaccination campaign, but by helping others have access to nutrition, helping them interact with positive role models, and helping them have a safe place to stay, my family and I were addressing the social determinants of health. A good meal prevents disease and increases overall healthfulness. It also increases attentiveness at school. Positive adult figures, as we know, increase resilience to the ACEs that we know far too many children, especially children of color, face. Having a safe space can increase cognitive and social functioning and allow young people to grow and to thrive. Now, I share that story with you for two main reasons. There's a lot you can take out of it, but there are two main reasons I share that story with you. First, it's an example of the multifaceted approach that we as a public health community should be engaging in to better health and to move toward health equity for all Americans. Second, and perhaps more noteworthy, I did it as a child, and I did it as part of a family that was barely above the poverty level ourselves. So yes, we need more funding. I'm not going to deny that. You'll never hear me say as a public health advocate that we don't want or need more funding. And yes, we need medical expertise. We need health expertise. We need to be grounded in the science. As your Surgeon General, you will never hear me say that we don't need more expertise, that we don't need more studies, that we don't need more science. But we can have a tremendous impact if we focus less on what we don't have and focus more on better engaging partners, engaging everyone to realize the potential that already exists in every single community in our country. You know, when I was health commissioner of Indiana, I would go out to different communities and folks would get all excited about the health commissioner coming into town. Same thing happens now when I'm Surgeon General and we get a big group and we do a round table and everyone wants me to give them all the answers. You know one of the things that sticks with me the most is I would go into those communities and there'd be a group sitting here like, like at this table and this person sitting here in this seat would be working on an issue and that person sitting in the seat right next to them would be working on an issue and they'd be in the same community and they wouldn't realize how many people in that very community were all committed to and working towards the same goal. What we need to change health already exists in our communities. We just have to be better at unleashing it. Now, please, please don't misunderstand me because former APHA president, Dr. Jones, Dr. Kamara Jones, she's a good friend of mine and she and I, we, we have very vibrant discussions about the role of government and about health equity. And at the end of the day, I consistently tell her, and I think she's finally starting to agree with me, that we, we believe in the same goals and the same end. I'm not saying there isn't a place for major systemic change in our country. No matter how many youth my family and I helped during our childhood, we could never change the systemic oppression and the institutional racism that affected many of my peers. It's too big of a hurdle for any one person, any one family, and in some cases, even any one community to tackle alone. But that's why I talk about better health through better partnerships, because there are so many different ways we can improve health if we commit to working across sectors and engaging new partners. So we had another discussion. I talked to many of the panelists earlier. You know, I talk about better health through better partnerships, and even when I look in the audience, I say it and I see people nodding their heads. Everyone believes in partnering. It's easy to say, it's a whole lot harder to do. So I'm going to give you some practical tips to being better partners and forging better partnerships. Number one, invite folks to your table and go to their table. Meet them where they are. Folks who you wouldn't necessarily think of. We had a discussion earlier. Who would have thought 
that for a health issue, you needed to invite the local sheriff to come and sit down and be part of that discussion. That's what we had to do in Scott County, Indiana. Who would think that the first person you should call when you're dealing with a health issue is the local priest? That's usually at the end when everything else is exhausted. Well, in Scott County, that's what we had to do to solve that HIV outbreak that was occurring in the community. So you've got to, again, think about those non-traditional partners and invite them to your table and go to their table. Number two, show them, what you, show them that you care. There's a great saying, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. As a physician, I think about motivational interviewing. Anyone ever heard of motivational interviewing? I've taken care of patients with diabetes, and I've gone through that same old cycle over and over and over again of saying, well, Mr. Mr. Jones, we diagnosed you with diabetes. Here's all the things that science says you need to do to improve your diabetes. Here's a prescription for your medicine. Um, lose weight. Exercise more. All right, see ya. Bye. Unfortunately, time and time again, we see that it doesn't work. Motivational interviewing is about asking Mr. Jones what he cares about instead of trying to push what I want on Mr. Jones, asking him what he cares about and then seeking areas of alignment so that we can get there. So Mr. Jones, you care about being able to, to see your grandkids graduate from school. You care about being able to, to walk or run that 5K with, with, your, with your daughter. You care about being able to make it to that softball game or to go on that vacation. Well, great. If we want to get you there, we've got to get your diabetes under control. And here are things that we can do together to get you there. That's motivational interviewing. It is our responsibility as public health professionals to show communities that we care about their needs rather than simply trying to ram a public health message down their throats. You know, we talked about the HIV outbreak in Scott County, Indiana, and there were a whole lot of folks who said, Dr. Adams, why didn't you just go down there and use your power as health commissioner to open up a syringe service program? Well, you know, if I'd gone down there and done that, the local sheriff would have set up a perimeter around the syringe service program and arrested people as they were coming in or going out. Doesn't matter what the science says, he still had his legal authority to do that. If I tried to ram it down their throats, there would have been a sermon at church the next week by the local pastor talking about how the health commissioner came in from out of town and was the devil trying to push this on their community. We have to engage people where they are and show them that we care. And I went to that community, and I didn't come down and say, you need a syringe service program. I came in and said, you know, you all have a problem. Tell me how you feel we should solve this problem. Tell me what your community needs, and let's figure out how we can get there together. And that's how we stopped the transmission of HIV in that community. Number three, last tip for better engaging partners, identify your target audience and adjust your messaging accordingly. I had a great conversation at uh, Robert Wood Johnson uh, with Rich Besser just a few weeks ago, and he and I share this commitment to being better communicators. We need to get much, much better at the science of effective health communication. And that's not going to be something that all of you all focus on, but it's something that I think we all as public health advocates, particularly during Public Health Week, need to think about. How can we be better effect and more effective health communicators? Just like going to another country, effective communication starts with knowing what land you're in and what language they speak. Anyone here speak English as a second language or learned another language first? So. Oh, we got, got two folks. So when, when you go, go uh, to outside the United States and the Americans come into town, what do they do? They find a person and they start talking to them in English. They expect that they're going to know English. And then when they don't know English, the Americans, what do they do? They speak louder. <laughs> they yell at them and expect that now suddenly they're going to understand what you're saying. We do that far too often in public health. We come in and expect that they're going to speak our language, and then when they don't understand it, we yell at them and call them names and, and expect that somehow that's going to help them come around to where we are. 
couple of real practical tools for you. Two of my favorite publications. One is Colin Woodward's The Eleven American Nations. Uh, Colin Woodward is a cultural anthropologist, and uh, what he did was break down the country into 11 distinct what he calls nations. And he calls them nations because they are very, very different. Folks don't realize how big and how different the United States is. I told them I wouldn't tell any old stories. The problem is you all give me the microphone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell stories. And I know everyone in here hasn't heard this story, so I apologize to the folks who have heard it. I was in Switzerland, and I was tasked with explaining to a bunch of people who are not from the United States the United States healthcare system, and I was given 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> Easy peasy, right? So here's what I said to them. I said, you know, when you look at Paris, France, and Berlin, Germany, these are two cities and two completely different countries. They speak different languages. And in the last great world war, they literally tried to blow each other off the planet. If either one had had their way, there would not be a France or a Germany right now. That's how different and distinct these countries are. But when you look at the top and most controversial health issues, public health issues, when you look at guns, when you look at access to health care coverage, when you look at women's rights and contraception and abortion, when you look at drug policy and harm reduction, these two places, Berlin, Germany, and Paris, France, that tried to wipe each other off the planet are closer together than Dallas, Texas, and Boston, Massachusetts. We truly are a country of different nations. I'm getting the hooks. I, they've been told, told me I've got to, got to start wrapping up here. So Colin Woodward and Ele the 11 American Nations. Uh, the other publication is Ro Robert Wood Johnson, a new way to talk about the social determinants of health. And what they did uh, there was poll 4,000 voters in the country and determine which, which phrases, which words resonated and which ones didn't. And, and then they, they gave you practical tips. Use, use phrases like opportunity. Everyone should have the opportunity to live a long and healthy life. Your neighborhood shouldn't be hazardous to your health. It gives you practical solutions to speak a language that's going to resonate when you're in a different nation that may be part of the same country. As I wrap up, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak to such a large audience about our country's opioid epidemic. Today in America, addiction is a public health crisis with an estimated 2.1 million people struggling with an opioid use disorder. That's more than the number of Americans diagnosed with cancer each and every year. But only one in five with an opioid use disorder receives any treatment at all. Each day we're losing a person every 12 minutes. And the time I've been on this stage talking to you, someone's died from an opioid overdose. Think about that. I see my role as Surgeon General to educate the American people about the severity of the epidemic and how everyone can be part of the solution. But all of you can play a role in combating the opioid epidemic. And that doesn't mean you have to drop your other priorities and focus solely on opioids. Doesn't mean that at all. I'm fond of telling folks we need to learn how to ride the wave. And the opioid epidemic provides a tremendous opportunity to amplify your messaging. I was in Tennessee about three weeks ago. Who would have thought that Tennessee in the middle of the Bible Belt would be leading the way in terms of talking about voluntary, long-acting, reversible contraception? Certainly I wouldn't, but they are. They're providing voluntary, long-acting, reversible contraception in prisons to women. And they're doing it through the lens of the opioid epidemic because they noticed they had some of the highest rates, not some of, the highest rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome in the entire country. They noticed that they had the highest rates of taking children away from their mothers in the country, all related to the opioid epidemic. And that created a wave for them to talk about long-acting reversible contraception. We know that the communities most impacted by the opioid epidemic are often the same communities that have high obesity rates, that have low graduation rates, that are affected by ACEs. There are opportunities to talk about so much of what we as public health advocates want to talk about through the lens of the opioid epidemic. And we also know that upstream interventions would help prevent or mitigate not just opioid-related issues, but all the issues that you care about. As I said to audiences, we've been trying for years, 
for decades to get people to pay attention, not just to addiction, not just to mental health and ACEs, but to the social determinants that exist in all communities, especially communities of color. We've got a great opportunity now because folks want to talk about that. I was at a cabinet meeting just a few weeks ago and you had the head of the Secretary of Labor, you had the head of HUD, you had the head of agriculture, you had all these folks around talking about social determinants of health. We have a great opportunity here, and I hate to say great in the midst of tragedy, but it's a unique opportunity to really push public health through the lens of the opioid epidemic if we're willing to ride that wave. I want to close by stating that every single one of you in this room, every single one of you, and I've talked to some people who've been in public health for a while, I've talked to some folks who are in college right now, some of my fellow retrievers over there still in college, every single one of you is a leader in your community by the nature of you showing up today. The fact that you showed up means that you are a leader and you have the potential to influence other people. It means you have an opportunity. It also means you have a responsibility to lead by example. It's imperative that all of us use our platforms to maximum effect, and that starts with humility and with servant leadership. A couple of challenges to leave you with. I challenge each and every one of you to think of at least one new partner who you can invite to your table and whose table you can go to. Whether it's the faith-based community, the educational community, uh, we have folks here from the Department of Ag, from the law enforcement community. Think of one new partner whose table you can go to and sit down at. Number two, I challenge you to stop. The next time you're about to ask someone to do something that you know is scientifically valid, and you know will improve individual or community health. Stop, just pause. Stop for one second and have the courage to instead ask that person what their goals and desires are before you start talking about yours. Show them that you care before you try to show them what you know. And then finally, I challenge you all to think about how you can be a more effective communicator. Because at the end of the day, we know what to do which is plain lousy at getting people to do it. Public health hasn't changed in the 20 years since I got my MPH. Move more, eat better, don't smoke, don't do drugs. All those lessons were there 20 years ago. We're just plain lousy at communicating to people what we need them to do. And it's because we don't recognize or we don't care that in many cases we're in a foreign language speaking, we're in a foreign land speaking a foreign language. My motto is better health through better partnerships, because no matter what area of public health you're passionate about, if you commit to forging better partnerships and being a better partner, good health is sure to follow. Thank you, APHA. Thank you, all of you, for being here and to the folks who are joining us um, via uh, webinar. Thank you for bringing such a diverse group of individuals together to collaborate with one another. And I hope each of you takes the opportunity, even here today, to find a new partner, to get to know someone, to get to know the person next to you, to figure out how you might be able to help them, and in turn, they might be able to help you. It's been a pleasure to address all of you, and my best wishes for a great Public Health Week. Thank you so much. Did I run out of time for questions? Did I have a little bit of time to grill me, or how are we going to do it? Okay. All right. We've got a little bit of time for questions. Anyone? In the back? Yes, ma'am. And tell us all who you are, too. Is yeah. it on? Yeah. Okay. Yay. Um, I'm Caroline Brazil. I work for Alvarez and Marsal Public Sector Services. Um, but my background is in public health. I worked for the Louisiana Department of Health and also for Aetna Medicaid. Um, so the more I work in healthcare, the more the issue of housing and housing insecurity um, is coming to the forefront. So you're talking about building better partnerships. And I've worked on the local level in housing and healthcare, and one of the roadblocks, I think, is the funding and the lack of intersection of that funding at the federal level. So can you talk about that a little bit and also maybe talk about what you're hearing from your housing counterparts about what they need from us? 
Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to step out here a little bit. One of the things that I tell folks is we have another tremendous opportunity. No matter which side you're on or how you feel about him individually, we have a position who's the head of the department, uh, who's the head of HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, a physician. And I've talked to Dr. Ben Carson. He believes that housing is health. If I told you all, even a, a two, two years ago, that we had the opportunity to have a physician as head of HUD, you all would say that would be fantastic. But we aren't taking advantage of it. We aren't engaging HUD on a national level and on a local level as public health advocates to the degree that we could. Dr. Carson believes in it. He's got initiatives out there trying to promote housing as health. But we need to help folks understand, again, how to actually make that happen, how to create healthy housing, because individuals just aren't as familiar with that. When I was in Indiana, uh, we had a lead situation where it was a HUD housing complex. And once upon a time, someone thought it was a good idea to build a housing complex on top of an old lead smelting facility. If we had engaged HUD and they had engaged public health, because again, it's both ways, if we'd done a better job of that, then maybe we could have avoided some of these unfortunate situations. So really taking advantage of that. The other thing is I talked about riding the wave of the opioid epidemic. We know that the number one predictor to whether or not you're going to be successful in recovery is having permanent supportive housing. Folks understand that. We have the opportunity to use the opioid epidemic to talk about housing as a social determinant of health. But again, we've got to be at the table and, and also really engaging folks from a business point of view. One of the things I want to do as Surgeon General is create a uh, Surgeon General's report on health in the economy. Because we know the number one thing that people vote on is jobs in the economy. The number two thing they vote on is safety and security. Health, typically not in the top five or even in the top ten. But if we can help understand how we can create housing communities that are not just good for health, but that are also good for lifting up the community, lifting up prosperity, then we'll be able to better engage partners and, again, not just ram it down their throats that you need to commit to healthier housing or you need to pay for housing, but that we can show you how we can create a community that millennials will want to move to, that, that companies, that Amazon, everyone's talking about Amazon and where they're going to take their headquarters. Let's create a community where Amazon says, heck yeah, I want to come to that community because millennials want to move there, there's parks, there's complete streets, there, there's no food deserts, it's going to be a great place to bring in people and for them to be productive, for them to be prosperous. If we can do that in a back and forth, we will be much more successful. If we approach housing and inject our public health input with a goal of increasing prosperity in addition to increasing housing, again, being, humil uh, being humble, coming in with, with, with a dose of humility, I think we can be successful. So great question and thank you for that. Maybe time for one or two more. Yes. Louise um, wondered if the opioid epidemic was a, a good way to talk about other addictions. And the answer, the easy, short answer is absolutely. The opioid epidemic is, is not the problem. It's the symptom. It's the symptom of unrecognized and untreated mental health issues. My own brother is in Maryland State Prison about an hour from here because he had unrecognized, untreated mental health issues, which he self-medicated which led him to steal $200 to support his habit and get a 10-year prison sentence. Uh, even upstream from that, adverse childhood experiences. Upstream from that, social determinants. Yes, there's a tremendous opportunity to talk about addiction to tobacco, which we know leads people. Uh, I've talked to folks, and one of the things I love hearing is, is their personal story about how they've struggled with addiction. And I can tell you, tobacco is in so many of these. We know that it can prime the brain for, uh, for other addictions opportunity to talk about alcohol. Let's move upstream and talk about all the things that can be a potential problem and stop playing whack-a-mole. Because what we can do with this opioid epidemic is treat it as just an opioid epidemic. And you know what? We'll get our hands around it eventually, but then it'll pop up somewhere else as something else further on down the road if we don't get upstream. So great opportunity. 
to talk about it. And the shirt surge in general, I do talk about it, and I plan to talk about, again, not just opioids, but addiction. Not just addiction, but mental health issues. Not just mental health issues, but adverse childhood experiences and resilience. Not just adverse childhood experiences and resilience, but social determinants of health. Not just social determinants of health, but healthy and prosperous communities and wellness that all will ultimately lead to better outcomes across the board. Maybe time for one more question. Thanks. My name is Benjamin Brooks. I am an unaffiliated public health professional, so call me. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about the role of, of public-private partnerships in your platform and if the Surgeon General's office uh, has any resources to support the development of those partnerships. Public-private partnerships are going to be huge. Uh, they, they already are increasing in prominence and in prevalence, but they're going to be huge. And we need to, again, again, think about how we can engage those private entities. Again, my report on health and the economy is not yes. about me going in and trying to tell businesses uh, that they need to take up my mantle. It's about me going in and showing you engage in, in creating a healthier environment. You're gonna, it's going to be easier for you to recruit people. You're going to have less absenteeism. You're going to have less presenteeism, which is showing up at work being less productive. You're going to have, have less workplace accidents. You're, you're going to be more prosperous across the board. We just got $6 billion to respond to the opioid epidemic, which is more money than we've ever gotten to respond to opioids. You know the challenge is that whenever we talk to folks, they continue to tell us it's going to cost so much more than that to actually be able to, to do what we want to do. Well, we also know that we've got a Congress and an American people who believe in a certain size pie. And that pie may get a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller depending on who's in charge. But at the end of the day, there's still going to be a finite pie. And there will never be enough of that pie coming from the federal government to solve all of our woes. We've got to figure out how we work smarter and not just harder, how we engage private partners, how we engage non-traditional partners. Again, I'm working with the military. Why? Because seven out of 10 people in the military are ineligible for military service because they can't pass the physical, they can't meet the educational requirements, or they have a criminal record. So why don't we have DOD and law enforcement and education and health all at the same table pooling their funding together and all the private groups that work in each of those areas trying to figure out how we can work smarter with the money we have instead of all going with our hands out separately to Congress over and over and over again saying make the pie bigger, make the pie bigger, make the pie bigger because my piece isn't big enough. So absolutely I believe in public-private partnerships. My, do I have the hook? You want to give one, some, one person a... Ma'am? As a student, she asked what would be uh, some advice I would give to folks as they embark on their career in public health. And I'll hit some points that I made earlier, but I'll try to rephrase them. Uh, I would say that we need to think beyond public health. We need to think about how, how public health feeds into the priorities of the voters, uh, of the private entities, of the corporations, of the law enforcement community, of, of the educational community and show them how we can help them achieve their goals. Um, focus on communication. You don't want to spend the next 20 years of your life working on an issue with your blinders on and then be frustrated and say, I didn't really make a difference, I'm still talking about the same things. We can make a meaningful change if we become more effective communicators, if we become better partners, and again, if we become servant leaders and walk in asking how we can serve others instead of expecting that because we've got the moral high ground and the science behind us that everyone is going to listen to us. Some more practical tips I really, uh, more specific to, to younger folks, I say take advantage of opportunities that come your way. I did a summer at Howard University in actuarial science. Anyone know what that is? That's the science of figuring out risk and it, you know, it was all about math and I, 
I know I loved math at the time, but ordinarily you think that has nothing to do with public health. I met some tremendous people, uh, gained some, some valuable skill sets. As long as you're increasing your network and learning something, it's, it, it is, it is a, a worthwhile endeavor. So continue to take advantage of those opportunities that come your way. Continue to grow. Continue to expand your network. Have your elevator speech tight. That's another thing I tell young folks all the time. I've had the privilege of being able to be at the side of the vice president for the last four plus years. Had the opportunity, I was over at the White House earlier this morning around cabinet officials and around the president. And what's funny to me is folks will sit down with me, you know, in a casual setting and say, if I had a chance to talk to President Trump, this is what I'd say. And then they get next to me in front of President Trump and <laughs> when we talk about an elevator speech, you've got 30 seconds or you've got 20 seconds. What do you want to communicate about what you're, about what you're interested in, about what you're doing, about who you are in an efficient manner to, to make the most use of your opportunity? And it goes back to effective communication. So. That's what I would say. Maybe one more before they give me the hook, because I love being up here talking with you all. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Amelia Robert. I'm with um, OCRFA, also graduated from LSE with my MPH last year, where um, I did some work on um, aging in public health. Um, in public health, I find we tend to focus a lot on um, young people, um, mm -hmm. children, teenagers, sometimes even young mothers, but we tend to neglect people who, as far as we see, have already kind of gone through life and all this, there all seems to be a feeling that there's nothing left we can do for them, but as most of us probably know, our population is rapidly aging. Um, so I wanted to hear what you think public health could do to address that. that. That's a wonderful question. I think public health could do a lot more, and again, there's another opportunity you have. As someone who's worked in health and in health care, everyone is shaking in their boots about the baby boomers um, aging and, and getting to the point where many of them are going to be retiring and leaving the workforce. They're going to be on Medicare, they're going to be drawing Social Security. There's an opportunity like never before to bring folks to the table and talk about what we're doing to take care of individuals across the life spectrum. The other problem is we, we silo things out again. We've got to break down those silos and bring non-traditional partners to the table. When you talk about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, the flip side of that is resiliency. One of the things that builds resiliency in a community is having a positive adult influence. I was talking with Ivanka Trump just last week, and she's really big on youth sports. One of the challenges with youth sports is we can't find enough coaches because parents are working or you've got single-parent households. Trying to utilize the aging population out there to, to become coaches, to engage. is going to help the kids. It's going to help them. But again, it's ultimately figuring out places where there's overlap, where our missions align, and not just saying, how do we help the, the aging in our society? But how can we better utilize the aging in our society as part of an overall mission? And once we get them engaged, we'll help them. They'll help us across the board. I think there's a great opportunity there. Before I leave, I can't believe nobody asked me about guns. I'm disappointed in you all. I am disappointed in you all. No, no. But what I would say before I leave is another tip for young folks. Travel as much as you can as much as you can, because I've experienced the 11 American nations just coincidentally by traveling around the country and seeing how different things are. I went to school in Baltimore, lived in an apartment with walls this thick, where if the person next to me had a gun, it was a direct threat to my life because it was going to come right through the wall and hit me if that gun discharged. So in that sense, and I said all public health is local just like all politics are local, in that local environment, Guns were a public health concern. My father-in-law, who I just put on an airplane this morning to send back out to northern Indiana, lives on a farm. I sat on his back porch and watched coyotes run across his backyard. Him not having a gun is a threat to his livelihood because that's how he defends himself and his livelihood. In that local environment, he sees someone wanting to take away his gun as threatening his livelihood and ultimately his life. So we need to understand that we, as leaders, need to foster these local conversations so that we can, again, have smarter policies across the board. We also need to um, make sure we're doing, and we talked about public-private partnerships, we need more research so we can say with more certainty and intelligence what policies work 
what policies don't, and when and where they work. Because a policy that works in one place may not work in another place. And a great example of that is a syringe service program. Again, there were folks in New York City and L.A. and in San Francisco who wanted to tell me how to run a syringe service program in rural Indiana. I go to New York City where there's more syringe service programs than, than anywhere else. And I can guarantee you, you can take the average person in New York City and they couldn't tell you where the nearest syringe service program was because it's not something that they experience in their everyday life, even though they've got more syringe service programs than anywhere. You go to Scott County, Indiana, you can go to the middle school and every kid in that middle school can tell you exactly where the syringe service program is. We need to make sure we're, we're leading local conversations, coming up with local solutions. And as public health advocates, as public health researchers, we need to make sure we're evaluating these programs in a way that, that allows us to then go to different communities and say, this will work in your community or has the potential to work because I've seen it work. I can tell you, when I was in Indiana, they didn't care what they were doing in Boston. They cared what was going on in Ohio, in Kentucky, in Illinois, in communities that were like their communities. And so to, to close it and to bring it back to the conversation about guns and about everything else, we need to make sure we're facilitating those local conversations and that we don't go in with our own biases and expect that because we believe something's right or because we saw it work in one community, that it's got to be the way that things are going to happen in another community. Because what's going to happen is that community is going to push back. They're not going to care what you know because they don't know that you care. So thank you so much for the opportunity to address you all. I look forward to working with each and every one of you all. You're the Army. You know, I just get to stand here in the nice uniform and, and, and talk, but you all are the ones who actually go out there and do it. And I am so thankful that you're here today. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to serve as your Surgeon General. And I hope that we all get the chance to talk even more as the future comes. So thank you, Georges, and thank you to the panel for being patient with me. It's going to be great. It's going to be a wonderful panel. And I hope all of you all pay close attention because I'm looking forward to it.